So welcome everybody to today's virtual edition of Labla Literary Salon. Thank you as always for calling in and spending this time with us. Um, as you can see, it is light where I am. It's no longer one o'clock in the morning for me in Nairobi hosting this. I'm back in New York, which is a very exciting journey that started on Saturday very early in the morning and ended on Sunday very late in the evening. So um, I'm really excited to be back here. Um, for probably quite some time. So I get to see a lot of you in a social distance way in real life. Um, so we have five amazing readers tonight. And um, we have Donna Hemans, we have Devin Jacobson, we have Zaina Arafat, we have Ryan Chapman, and we have Bonnie Twee. So I'm gonna pass it over to Donna to get us started. Hi, Donna. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. And I'm um, yeah. glad you could all join us. So uh, my novel, Tea by the Sea, is set both in Jamaica and in Brooklyn. And it's a story of a young mother who is searching for her child who was taken from her at birth. And so at the outset of the novel, we know, um, we know who has the child. The father has the child. And um, we, it, it opens with him walking um, to the place where he's going to hide out. And then, and also in that first chapter, you see the mother plum. So I'm going to read two short sections, and one is the first part where, where we first meet Plum, and then a little bit later on when we see her um, actively searching. Indeed, Plum looked for Lenworth. She returned to their small cottage on property that at one time had been a large pimento and cattle estate. The pimento and the cattle were long gone. The surrounding land subdivided and developed as residential plots. All that was left of the estate were the cottage and the larger house, which from the outside looked like it would crumble without much prompting from a single puff of wind, then decay. But it was only an illusion. Inside was an artist's dream. Every inch of wood on the floor and the ceiling had been replaced with hand-sanded and hand-carved mahogany. The plaster walls had been rebuilt with new concrete walls, which were painted a light cocoa, orange and green. The paint brushed on to make the walls look as distressed as the outer perimeter of the house. Necessary mod modern conveniences were interspersed with remnants from another time. Enamel bowls, yabas, and shutters that banged in the breeze. On her return, Plum passed the main house with its front walkway flanked by two large monkey jars, flowering bougainvillea and hibiscus, and dwarfed by the flame of the forest trees behind it, both in full bloom. The flowering plants with their red and pink and yellow blooms celebrating life, taunted and teased, made tears flood, pl flood Plum's eyes again. She walked past the house to the cottage in the back and found the rooms had been stripped of Lenworth's things, his CDs and books and papers and clothes. He didn't have much, but everything belonging to him was gone. Plum's clothes hanging in the wardrobe were, me were meager, forlorn and childish, a reminder that she had only just begun her adult life. Plum ran back out, tottered really, and found her landlady, Mrs. Murray, the artist who had given new life to the decrepit and rundown historic house. Look at you, Mrs. Murray said. She held out her hands, palms upward, and fingers played, surprise and joy in her voice. Have you seen him? Plum asked. Lenworth? No. He's gone. What you mean gone? The levity in Mrs. Murray's voice was absent now. She looked over Plum with one sweeping glance, capturing Plum's heavy breasts and swollen belly, and the distraught look on her face. She caught Plum before she fell, held her up, linked their arms, and walked back to, her, to the cottage. Inside the cottage, Plum lay on the floor and bawled, rocking and heaving on the ground like a Pentecostal possessed by the Holy Spirit, throwing off the landlady attempting to hold and calm her. When she had no tears or sobs left to pour out, and no strength to stand up, she knelt and looked around at the barred furniture that came with the cottage, then stood and looked around again for something of Lenworth's, a handwritten explanation, a clue to where he had gone and why. But she found nothing, no sign that he had lived there at all. Had it not been for her breasts achingly full, it would have all felt like a miserable dream a nightmare that Plum wasn't actually living and from which she would wake at any minute. Neither had words for what had happened. Lenworth was gone and so was her child, the daughter she had planned to name Marissa. They let the silence steep. For Plum, the quiet was less painful than the sounds of life, 
the twitter and buzz of birds and bees, the swish of leaves, the wind in the trees, a donkey brain in the distance. Mrs. Murray's lone parrot, which had escaped its cage again, cawed incessantly, taunting them from a guava tree. I hate that bird. Plum did the only thing she could in that moment. She stepped outside, picked up a small stone and threw it at the parrot, forgetting that its wings had been clipped to prevent it from flying away. Um, and so I'm jumping forward now to eight years when she is in Jamaica looking um, for her child. And um, she spent some time going back and forth from Jamaica to Brooklyn. Eight years of active searching had come to this, an abandoned house, an outdoor stove and a doll, signs of a former life, but not necessarily his and hers. No trace of where Lenworth and her daughter had gone. No trace even of the girl's name. There was no telling how long the house had been empty. Weeks, months, years. She wouldn't cry. Instead, Plum forced her disappointment deep within and buried again the words she had practiced for her little girl. There was no use in waiting, but Plum waited anyway on the veranda, her arms on the railing, her eyes strained on the hill and the roof of the house in the valley below. Her body like that of a woman expecting her family or visitors to appear any minute at the bottom of the hill. Clouds shifted in and out. Smoke rose from an outdoor fire near the house below with the rusted zinc roof. Goats let loose in the morning bleated as they made their way back home. Only when the sun was nearly down did she leave, weaving her way back down the hill in the shadows of the large breadfruit and star apple trees and back down the long hill past Reading through the city of Montego Bay and onto a mid-sized hotel in Iron Shore. She took with her the one-legged doll and an unconvincing conviction that her search would end right there at the house in Anchovy. She had come up empty too many times and each time she walked away empty-handed, she relived that first night, waking to find her baby gone, coming home to a house that was no longer hers, feeling again like a castaway abandoned at the first sign of trouble. That end there. Nice. Thank you so much, Donna. As Meredith wrote in the chat, literally as I was having the exact same thought in my mind that you really took us there and it was so vivid, everything that you read. Thank you so much for sharing both of those parts with us. Certainly, thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna paste in the chat right now, a link to Donna's book um, through Bookshop. So please um, support writers and independent bookstores. All right, thank you so much, Donna. I'm gonna pass it over to Devin Jacobson. Hi, Devin. Hi, hey, can everybody hear me okay? Perfectly, yes. Excellent. Welcome. Great. So just a quick thanks to Paige and, uh, and to Lori and also to Jacob Smolian for all their hard work on the book. Um, it's my uh, debut novel. It's called Breath Like the Wind at Dawn. It's a, uh, it's kind of a Western, I guess, and it, but it's set in Minnesota and it's about um, this family that reunites uh, a while after the Civil War and about what happens. Um, but the chapter I'm going to read is... Uh, uh, about five chapters in the book, but you don't really need too much setup at this point. It's um, it's about two, uh, at this point, two brothers, two twin brothers who are outlaws have just kidnapped a bunch of horses and they're trying to, um, to sell them. So, yeah. With the loudness constrained, they were rapping his door while checking the neighboring houses, lest they rouse anyone by mistake. Their heart kicking in their gullet. For these were the opportunities they most risked being caught. The door dropped open and out of it slung a barrel in their face as if something for them to taste. The old man was winking to make sense of the dark or did not believe what stood before him. Thieves, he stammered, but already he was scanning the horses wrangled in the yard. Shh, said Quinn, showing in his hands that he held nothing. We ain't here to rob you, old man. We got something you might care to praise. Oh yes, thieves, you boys are. Hesitant, he stepped out from his den, forth from the cavernous dark wrenching his neck and checking if there was anyone sighting him at the end of the street from behind a porch up on the gables. He gave the impression of a half rung rooster. You boys may not be robbing me directly, he said, but someone's had to pay. And I suspect you may have done chipped in. He spoke this, noting Quinn's sullen socket. And here I thought we was friends, said Irving. Friends? Bah, the old man huffed. We ain't friends. Ain't never been friends. 
You're somewhere between a stranger and an acquaintance. I hope these Dobbins ain't branded. You gonna look at them or not, said Quinn. In the bluish remnant of night, he went around, smacking his lips and muttered some, at once skeptical and wholly decisive. Within the words themselves, two sides that seemed to contest and vie. Had he not just spoken to them, they would have thought he was crazy, pulling up hooves and squinting into mouths, and flicking his nails against teeth, and running his palms along gaskins, and counting the pace of heartbeats and turning up tails, and peering in with the cunning of a jeweler, inspecting a diamond of long-winded renown taking especial pains over a thumb-width whirl of scar, studying a blaze as if he were preparing to declaim his thoughts on some renowned work of art he had always heard championed, but himself had never chanced to scrutinize until this moment. He gave the impression of omniscient perspicacity, of reading their entire lives and every singularity from the planting of gestation to their standing before his home. Well, what do you think? I thought the old man snapped from his great reckoning. So suddenly he appeared to have lost all interest, some stake in him uprooted like a tent swept away in a gust, whereupon he sighted his powerful attention against the twins who were watching him intent. Well, I can do 50, said Hancock. He figured, his figure looked cold and dead out there in the cold dead morning. You can do 50 what? He can't do 50 nothing, Quinn said. I'll give you $50, and that's the end of my crossing point. It came as shocking when repeated. For which horse, Quinn asked. He said it not quite as a whisper. It ain't for which, said Hancock. The 50 stands for all. For all, yelled Irving, running his grip along his belt. Why, hell, what about the thoroughbred? He alone is worth at least 100, at least 100. Hancock spat. His stare was as fixed as marble. Boys, that horse has the worst case of thrush on her legs I ever seen in 40 years of being open for business and is past curing to sin. See that landing a toe? Why, you'd be better off just shooting her than sinking your time and money in thrush but she ain't worth hardly for the price of the bullet. In fact, I wouldn't take her if you paid me to. Come to think of it, and I ain't just being nice, but to show you boys how serious I do despise a thrush, you boys go on and keep that one that ain't worth the hour of pickling over. And I'll give you the 50 for the rest of them. You can split that real even down the middle. Shoot, said Quinn. We can take them to somebody else. Somebody not bent on swindling their best customers. Donahue's always fair. Ha, I'm sure they'll be doubly wanted at Donahue's. Damn, said Irving. He was picking at his belt. What's so wrong with the rest of them? I've watched them run a week and I'll be damned if they're all bad. I'll be proud to sit my ass in any of them steeds. At that, the old man burst out a laugh, short but stern and bumptious. What's so bad? It was a scoff the way you tell a blind man that the reason it was so loud and reeked of smoke was because you were trundling him through the same battlefield that had just gone and blinded him. Well, I'd say whoever it was you boys robbed, I'd say they was the cheapest sons of bitches ever to run a horse. That or didn't know nothing about choosing jades. They had lost a hand of cards one right after the other and traded their last pair of pants for these here sorry plugs I'd hate to lump with the proper name of horses. Well, what's so bad with the paint, he asked him almost to dare. Boy, both them paints got bull necks no serious rider's ever going to look at twice. Not when you can buy a better shaped neck for a fair price. Those Arabian's pastures are too upright. She's already got arthritis, as I'd be happy to point out, and that's just going to get worse. This Morgan's barrel is going to pop like a dead dog in the sun about any day because he's got abdomen troubles. And fellas, that Appaloosa must be staler than my grandmother's milk. You pay my sincere respects when he kills over on you and you're singing fare you well out at the trailhead. Let's just take them to Donahue, said Irving, wanting to rid himself of the traitor whom he would rather agree with than continue hearing. Donahue's bound to be paid. Bound, Donahue's bound to pay at least a hundred. I don't know why we keep coming back to this guy. Shoot, said Quinn. He'll be dead before he takes his next squat. Okay, said the man. He became erect and, erect and rigid. I'll give you a hundred for the lot of them, but that's only so you don't go waking up a poor, uh, don't so, that's only so you don't go waking up poor Donahue and wasting the time of a friend. Some while before sunup they left town, the constant hooves firing strong and rampant since they had freed themselves of the caravan, which had parted from them like the guilt of a bad deed, the fresh thunder almost blameless. They had agreed going north because the trail was not so much traveled, after a few days to veer northwest until they alighted on or near Utica. The sun crept over the horizon, illuminating the gray plains of, of clouds choked overhead, but you would scarcely have known it, for rendering a light almost without shadow, it remained behind them, black rolled out clouds almost purple at their centers, like an actor forbidden to come on stage. They man it galloping, and wind boiling to an insane drumbeat. They heard only the thick, magnificent pounding, the quapping of heart or hooves or of the beating that had crept through their legs, inspiring their veins into beating in wild unity the wind cresting like rushes from an undiscovered waterfall. 
a flock of geese shot ass, evasive being caught. The rich, feast, the rich feast of speed spilled out vociferous of all words. The terrific pleasure, the ludic gestures, the part attempts to stand in the stirrups and extend their view to that of a titan striding the air. And with that, the solace that even if the old man had swindled them, yet ahead lay a wealth so immense and wonderful, their best winning streak would seem a downright cheek to compare. Glancing back now and then to ensure no one was following them. When he woke, he had the whole sky in his face and the vicious doubloon of noon as paled through clouds. It did not take long to verify that a lone rider was coming, his pace a drifting walk. So. Thank you so much, Devin. Wow, that dialogue is fantastic. Another reading where I just completely felt like we were in the outdoor space with them, <laughs> I was going to say, in the room. Um, I'm going to post the link now to Devin's book in the chat here. Thank you again, Devin, really appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm gonna hand it over to Zaina Arafat. Welcome, Zaina. You're on mute, so just with you. Yeah. Oh, that's there, right. We have Hi. You now. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, thank you. I'm gonna read from my um, debut novel that came out last week. It's called You Exist Too Much. So I guess I'll read from it. <laughs> Uh, okay. This is a, I don't think it needs any setup, even though it's a story, it's, it takes place in the middle of the book. Um, oh, okay. Sorry, one sec. Okay. Kate and I had been secretly sleeping together for almost a month when I noticed a bruise on her upper thigh. What's that? I asked. As the question left my mouth, I feared I wouldn't want to hear the answer. Oh, Blake, she said. He does that when I'm on top of him. Kate was a best looking senior superlative, field hockey captain, camel light smoking, dead bootleg listening straight woman. She was also my freshman year college roommate. Blake was a golden dreadlocked, sharp nosed sur surfer. He was a townie and older than both of us. Kate had been sleeping with him for two weeks. I pretended not to mind. In the light of day, she and I had never spoken about our nights. The closest we came to a talking about it was the morning after the first time. We'd gone out for her birthday the night before, to the bar where I worked. She wore a billabong hoodie that hugged her torso. Over drinks, I'd given her a present, David Gray's white ladder. After opening her gift, she leaned across the table and kissed me on the cheek. I could smell blue moon on her breath. We ordered stuffed oysters, a questionable choice at a college dive. A preset 80s mix blared through the speakers. We got up to dance when Take On Me came on, moving our bodies closer and shimmying our way to the floor, then grabbing onto each other to pull ourselves back up. I could feel people watching and I liked it. Once home, we put on the CD. It was whiny, brooding, melodramatic, and we lay side by side to listen. Nothing out of the ordinary until she began caressing my face, tracing my eyebrows, my nose, my lips. Then she kissed me. Nervous, I stopped her. I don't want to ruin our friendship, I said. It was a line from movies, what the girl always said when a guy friend made a move. Kate tilted her head back a little too far and laughed. Don't worry. We're just, you know, experimenting. So I didn't worry. Besides, I wasn't attracted to Kate, so maybe it was safe to let her experiment with me. But when I woke up the next morning and glanced at her beside me, still asleep, the danger was apparent. She looked different than she had the day before. How had I never noticed her long brown lashes, her strict, elegant nose, her pink pastel lips? I slid out of bed and tiptoed to my side of the room. I had no desire to leave her, but was afraid that waking up beside each other would be too jarring. It was the first day of spring break. We were spending the week road tripping along the Florida coast with her friends. It was a 13 hour drive south to Fort Lauderdale, our first stop. After about 30 minutes, I heard Kate shifting in her bed. What time is it, she called out from under the covers, her voice muffled by the comforter. Still early, I said. After that, we said nothing to each other as we packed on opposite sides of the room. 
I filled the silence with paranoid speculation. Was she ashamed by what we'd done? Had it been awful for her? Or had she been too drunk to remember? For a moment, I worried that I had imagined it. But no, I hadn't. It had happened. I could still smell her on my pajamas. In the car on the way to pick up her friends, we slowed to a stop at a traffic light. So, she said, does this mean we can't join the military? Over the next week, we made out in Fort Lauderdale, Boca Raton, Miami, Key West. She'd drop a quick kiss on my cheek when no one was looking, touch my thigh under tables, climb into my sleeping bag after everyone else had passed out. Three weeks after Florida, I watched her leave the bar with Blake in the middle of my set. I'd never seen him before, and I asked the bartender who he was. Apparently, he was a local craftsman. He'd been in Costa Rica for the past few months on an extended surfing trip. He had honey-colored dreadlocks and a deep tan. I kept eyeing him, watching him order a succession of red stripes and greet the numerous women who came up to hug him. He seemed equally excited to talk to each of them, and I imagined that every last one of them walked away feeling wanted. I noticed him noticing Kate, which triggered deep panic. I kept looking over as he subtly inched his way closer to where she was sitting. I wanted to cry when I saw him tap her on the shoulder, then offer a little wave when she turned around to see who it was. A good move, I thought to myself. I overheard him ordering another beer and asking if she wanted one as well, which she did. Hey, the chef called out to me. Order up. Orders, in fact. I looked to the kitchen window and saw several steaming plates waiting to be carried out. I had no choice but to turn away from the horrific scene just as they were laughing about something. Before heading to the kitchen, I reached over the bar and poured myself a shot of Jägermeister, then another. The place was packed and I could only catch snippets of them talking. Why did they keep laughing? What was so funny? I thought I might die when she tapped his stomach, the lines of his six pack visible through his shirt. But no, that came later as I watched him drop a 20 on the bar, take her hand and lead her out the front door. After they left, I drank three rail royales, the house specialty consisting of a shot of every liquor in the rail and a splash of Sprite. I clocked out, got into my car and backed into a dumpster. I'm not sure how long I'd been sitting there when a cop appeared and tapped on the plastic driver's side Jeep window. Instead of unzipping it, I opened the door and spilled out of the car. She's sleeping with someone else, I cried as I stumbled into the policeman, and I'm falling in love with her. He collected me in his arms as I thrashed against his chest, tipsy passerby stopping to view the spectacle. I imagined that in fear, if not compassion, he dropped the charge from a DUI to an underage possession. He called a cab and sent me home. I didn't see Kate until the following night. I took the campus bus back to the dorms after my shift, and as it approached my stop, I was dreading the sight of her. When I got to our room, she was sitting on the couch eating a bowl of Easy Mac. Hey, she said, where have you been? I told her about what happened after she left the bar. I still have to pay a fine, I said, for the dumpster. Kate didn't respond. Did you hear me, I asked. She stood up and threw the bowl at my head, something I'd only seen my mother do. It shattered against the wall as I dodged out of the way. Orange elbow noodles splattered across the wall. You think it's my fault, she yelled. Don't you? You think it's my fault this happened to you? At that moment, I knew. Her guilt, encouraged by my immediate surrender and lack of resistance, would eventually destroy us. At the same time, it would be my only weapon against her. I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow, Dana, thank you so much. My gosh, what a relatable, horrible feeling. <laughs> you wrote so well. Um, thank you. I'm going to share Zaina's link here as well. And so exciting that that came out just last week. I thought it was a few weeks ago, so I was wrong. Thank you for oh, reading this one so fresh. Really thank you. It. Thanks, Zaina. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it over to Ryan Chapman. Hi, Ryan. Hey, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you, Paige, for inviting me. This is really great. Um, 
I'm going to read um, from my uh, debut novel, which came out, um, I think, just, in, just around a year ago. Um, it's like right there. OK, there we go. I do like the news anchor um, over the shoulder thing. Um, so the, the book um, is about a um, incarcerated Sri Lankan man in upstate New York who is writing his life story um, as quickly as possible. And um, it's not at all. So my, my father's Sri Lankan, and there's some like, family stories in there, but he's not in prison. And um, he's not an egomaniac, unlike the narrator. Um, I'm going to read a little, just a little bit from a point in the book where the narrator is talking about um, his time as a doorman for a luxury building in the Upper West Side. And I don't think you need to know anything else except the building is called the Bernays and it is uh, darkly comic. And there's like one or two words in here that I probably will mispronounce even though I practiced earlier because um, there's just certain words my mouth will never be able to say correctly. So here we go. Um, Any old fool can be a doorman. I was the greatest doorman, going above and beyond to ensure total comfort for the septuagenarian and octogenarian, and in the case of Miss Beale's nonagenarian women of the Bernays. Many of our residents' husbands had fulfilled their actuarial duties in predeceasing these ladies. And I quite preferred the widows, truth be told. Total comfort meant knowing where to unload the Gristidis bags in every kitchen and every apartment. Total comfort meant remembering which grandchildren Ms. Rothschild spoiled and which grandchildren to send away. Total comfort meant cooing at Ms. DeWitt's purchase of a Givenchy's toddler's bib, the same one she purchased four days previous and would again purchase four days hence. Total comfort meant directing Miss Wang's visitors through the maid's door as her site-specific Richard Serra barred entrance from the main foyer. Total comfort meant retrieving a battered old TV from the hallway closet in 303 and setting it on the upholstered Louis XIV chair so Ms. Miyaki Burns could watch The Price is Right, reruns and exhale lusty gutturals at Bob Barker's face. She reserved impotent mues for the contestants who overbid on common household items like combination washer dryer units and vacuum cleaners with attachments for hard to reach places. Ms. Miyaki Burns once confided she had frequent nightmares about appearing on the show and overbidding on herself. She was both contestant and product, speculating wildly amid vociferous suggestions from the audience. Every weekday morning, I'd return at 9.30 or so to hoist the TV back into the closet. I remember one spring evening, she returned from a Bloomberg gala, award in hand. She invited me up to watch TV with her, and I thought, why not? It was after 11 at that point, and the building pretty much retired by 8. We passed a pleasant 30 minutes or so watching Turner Classic Movies. Before she fell asleep on her settee, her slim frame weighed down by a Lanvin pendant necklace, Ms. Miyaki Burns pointed the TV and whispered, the actor who plays that horse is dead now. I've read enough biographies inside to know how little interest any of this holds. I cannot fault your flagging attention. We only wish to know the story behind why a known personage is known at all, if you will, without all the pre preamble. Everyone comes from somewhere, which is another way of saying everyone comes from nowhere. It's just plain uninteresting, and I agree with you. And yet, and yet. My years at the Bernays are as much a part of me as the holding pen, the prison newsletter he edits. Even if the latter has brought me this readership and infamy, and the former brought me nine consecutive life sentences, as much as I intend this final issue to be my apologia and an official accounting of events as they happened, I must also be true to my own higher calling and hope you'll excuse a detour into autobiography. I remember the smells of the Bernays, those returned first, the ladies dowsing in perfume to ward off the decrepitude. They really poured it on for the charity galas and visits to, the, to their geriatrician, usually a Max von Sydow type with an office on park. I'd hold open a taxi door and inhale a fog of bergamot and ambergris. The scent hung in the lobby for hours, resistant to the mini fan that we kept behind the redwood podium. It bonded to the skin 
under our uniform and good luck trying to lose it with exercise or after work beers. I wonder how much that olfactory barrage contributed to my bachelorhood in those days. It was like carrying around a rodent drowned in patchouli oil. And I'm sure I triggered many a memory of incontinent grandparents for whoever was unlucky enough to stand near me. This was all well before I'd awoken my artistic temperament, mind you, which I know now is sexual catnip. As Steve Martin said, it's all about timing. I don't think it's a stretch to say the contours of my life back then fit closely to that of my job. The job was everything. And I preferred it that way. Did I want for entertainment? No, from my Bernays post, I could watch the entire world go by. And since it was Manhattan, the entire world did go by. Tourists with their slow zigzags, one in four stopping to ask for directions, junior analysts walking three abreast in iceberg blue dress shirts and tropical wool slacks, wolfing down burritos in their lunch break. With their sweaty cheeks, it looked like something being birthed backwards. The Hispanic construction crews debating football and ferrying ladders and buckets, the neighborhood was under constant restoration. Jamaican nannies in their charges in military grade strollers, both of them wearing headphones. And the women, it was all I could do to restrain myself from relief in the coatman's closet. I'm um, sorry, the doorman's coat closet, which I only resorted to a half dozen times, or maybe a baker's dozen. But most often I would look up and exhale through my mouth in a silent whistle. I'd look up and I'd count the window AC units on the Chatworth across the street, the little silver knuckles running up the stories. I suppose what attracted me to the job is the simple truth that the livery doorman is not an individual, and this is as it should be. It was thrilling to take a nine hour vacation for myself to become pure function inside a well-weathered apparatus. That apparatus thankfully came wrapped in romantic delusion. Look to your classic American films of the 1940s and there we are, quiet, solicitous, taking Miss Kelly's bags, Miss Hepburn's bags, a white gloved helping hand for the post-war magnates and their wives and children. We dialed their Dr. Feelgoods the proletariat panic of the 1970s, their fixers in the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s, their Eastern Bloc party girls in the go-go 90s. The court appointed psychiatrist later told me I should have been troubled by the thrill I derived from anonymity. I suppose for others, it was more difficult to wear the costume of self-effacement, whereas I could remain stock still at my perch for hours, gazing into the middle distance like a dutiful statuary. One night, after returning from a midship tipple at O'Malley's bar, I swear to you my head detached from my body and floated around the lobby like a balloon without agency or direction. I consulted James, one of the second shifter doormen. He'd put in the time, surely he could relate. I don't recall now his response, but the gist was this. Everyone thinks they're a fake. Everyone's lying constantly and no one gets caught. The lies are just too complex to determine guilt, let alone any kind of reckoning. Calm down and stop worrying so goddamn much. James then went into a short rant about the lack of reckoning in society as a whole, epitomized by the recent drug scandals at the Scripps National Spelling Bee. I stopped listening and wondered instead how he might react if I pulled my dick out of my trousers and urinated on his shoes. I confess that I experienced many of these fugitive thoughts, more so near the end of a shift. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, I really like where you left us, actually. I think that that was a perfect um, spot that makes us all want to know exactly what's going to go on next. So I'm going to share the link so that everybody can order your book and figure it out. OK, so here is the link to Ryan's book. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, so now I'm going to hand it over to Bonnie Tui. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, Ryan, I just also first want to say that the second you said Gristidi's bags, I was there on the street with you in New York. <laughs> it just takes a one tiny detail like that. Um, thank you so much, Paige, for having us. Thank you all for being here. I'm really, um, I'm really glad to join you. Um, I am going to read from Why We Swim which is uh, a nonfiction book that I came out April 14th. And um, it's a cultural and scientific exploration of our uh, human relationship with water and with swimming. 
And the book is sort of structured in the five different ways, five different ways we can answer that question. So survival, um, well-being, community, competition, and flow. And I'm going to read from the very beginning of the community section of the book. Um, and it doesn't really need that much setup except that uh, it's telling a story of the sort of anchor story in it is, is this uh, swim club that formed in um, Baghdad in Saddam Hussein's swimming pool in 2008. Beyond the wave they had gone through, they finally showed side by side, still six feet apart, swimming shoreward with a steady stroke until the next wave should make them body surf it or face it and pierce it. Jack London, the Kanaka surf, that's the epigraph. The man floated in the pool, a speck of cool in a sea of hot. The brutal midday sun had burned off, leaving a lingering warmth in the desert air. Late afternoon, early evening, these were the best times to swim. If he looked up, he could see the palm-fringed canopy of the trees that lined the Baroque open-air pool, offering merciful shade to those seated at the edge. Turning his head, he could see the diving platforms of varying stratospheric heights and the exquisite handcrafted tile that lined the terrace. If he dove down into the rich layered blue depths, he could pretend he was in the Caribbean. If while floating, he held his head in a certain way, submerging his ears, he could avoid hearing the constant sound of firing practice, a percussive paka 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 that never let up. Even though I know all about green Sahara paleo lakes by now, swimming in the desert still sounds like a kind of fever dream. The man, Joseph J. Taylor, often felt that way himself. In Baghdad, which has been called the hottest place on earth, temperatures can exceed 120 degrees in the summer months. But despite being surrounded by desert, Baghdad itself is a green city situated along the winding Tigris River, its banks lined with willows, palms, and poplars. At one of the serpentine bends in the river, you will find Saddam Hussein's royal palace and its outdoor pool. The expansive swimming pool was commissioned by the dictator to please his two murderous sons who were fond of swimming. It had an irregular bean shape, 33 yards at its longest, and a magnificent poolside decor that included dramatic lighted fountains, tall leafy trees, and a pillared stone rotunda of heroic dimensions. Between 2008 and 2010, Jay was stationed in Baghdad as a cultural attache for the US Foreign Service. It was a volatile, it was a volatile period in Iraq. The U.S. Embassy was situated on the grounds of the Royal Palace. Its official name was the Republican Palace, one of the many palaces and opulent homes that Hussein had built in strategic locations around the country, 81 by one count. Each of them had a pool, an unequivocal sign of wealth in the desert. The Republican Palace was the residence where the dictator liked to entertain visiting heads of state. He himself did not live there, but it had 258 rooms and sprawling grounds. At the time Jay was there, the palace anchored the green zone where the international community resided, military, diplomats, and civilians alike. It was deemed the safest place in Baghdad, though the first few months of Jay's tenure saw incessant shelling of the zone with numerous casualties. Here, the idea of an outdoor swimming pool seemed, to put it mildly, a little cuckoo, especially one like this, adorned with 18-foot fountains, and lighted with standing chandeliers for nighttime swimming. Jay couldn't believe that he got to swim in it, even if on more than one occasion he had to jump out of the deep end at the scream of an air raid siren and still dripping, clamber hastily into a concrete bunker as the boom of exploding mortars vibrated around him. Vibrated around him. He swam every day and he wasn't alone in his love of the pool. Daring soldiers made use of the tall diving platforms and posted their exploits on social media. But mostly people just like to get in, paddle around a bit, sit at the edge, shoot the shit. Jay would occasionally see other swimmers doing laps. The swimming lessons began one evening when Jay, after his workout, spotted his colleague, Andre Rambalamanana, a tank of a man from Madagascar, Andre was an experienced kickboxer on land, but in the water he was flailing, thrashing so violently that Jay feared he might drown. Andre, what are you doing? Jay asked him. Just swimming, boss, Andre replied. Jay offered to take on Andre as a student. Next, he signed up Valya Kristeva from Bulgaria and Sandy Yannick, also from Madagascar. 
Before long, strangers started inquiring at Jay's office about swim lessons, and he set up two beginner classes a week. Cooks, drivers, translators, peacekeeping troops, helicopter pilots. People from all over the world, from all kinds of places and backgrounds, wanted Jay to be their coach. Merlin Espinal from Honduras, Indrani Paul from India, Maka Barats from Ukraine, Mai Shaheen from Lebanon, J.P. Santana from Mexico. It was a miniature United Nations, a global diaspora of people who had never learned to swim. They called him Coach J, and they called themselves the Baghdad Swim Team. Coach J is a pen pal of mine. We began corresponding after he'd read an essay that I'd written about swimming as a last refuge from connectivity, the digital kind. He wrote to me to argue the opposite, that swimming is a way to form community, forge bonds, and find solace in a common pursuit. I wondered about all those people who ended up in Baghdad never having learned how to swim. And I wondered, how is it that some of us get to swim and what stops those of us who don't? What forces keep us out of the water and are they the same no matter where you come from? This is about how swimming has brought us together and how it has kept us apart. Thanks. That is such a cool story. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Um, I've spent a lot of time in like the equivalent zone in Mogadishu and there's also a huge swimming pool there and it's really interesting how the different kinds of people interact in that area and that part of the compound because you never really go to different parts of the compound than for wherever your own agency is or your own right or whatever it is so that was really interesting to see um, and really cool to hear about this one I had no idea about that so thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put the link now. Oops, I'm trying. The link for Bonnie's book. Here we go. Great. Um, so thank you, everybody, so much. That concludes another super fun Lay Blow virtual edition. Um, a huge thanks to Donna, Devin, Zaina, Ryan, and Bonnie. Um, please buy books continue supporting these amazing writers and independent bookstores. And, and we'll be back again on Saturday night. So if you'd like to join again on Saturday at 6 p.m., we'll be here. Um, so thank you all so much for calling in. And I hope to see you again soon. And thanks to all the readers. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>